For today, let me talk about the Soma Rasa, which many classical yoga texts describe as the nectar of immortality. The Soma Rasa is the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, and this is a substance we produce in the central nervous system, particularly in the ventricles of the brain. And then from the ventricular system, it flows out of the central nervous system, and it will cover and surround the surface of the brain inside the skull, the cranial cavity. And together with the other layers of protection there, like the dura mater, the uh, arachnid mater, and the pia mater, so we keep the brain protected from mechanical shocks, as well as trauma. So the cerebrospinal fluid acts as a cushion, so it keeps the brain floating inside the skull. And together with the other protection there, so we keep the brain protected from mechanical shocks and trauma. And it also uh, helps in the promotion of healthy intracranial pressure, as well as providing nutrients and immunity to the brain inside the cranial cavity. And the cerebrospinal fluid also flows down through the central uh, canal surrounding the spinal cord, giving the spinal cord protection, immunity, and nutrients as well. All right, so first I will be talking about the science behind the cerebrospinal fluid, how we produce this substance, and how it flows through the system, because this is closely related to the meditative practices we do in yoga. And what happens once the cerebrospinal fluid becomes electrically charged or magnetized or ionized now through the practice of these methods right like the kriyas kumbhakas pranayamas mudras and meditation and so these are really related and this will lead to various uh, energetic astral and spiritual realizations and experiences yes there is a direct link between science and providence and the beauty of understanding the process from the scientific um, point of view is that once we attain the spiritual uh, manifestations or experiences, we can translate it in a more real life sense. And so we become less mis mystical, it is less es esoteric, something which could be learned. Yeah, so this, this is really scientific. That's uh, one of the reasons why I love yoga. It's a, it's a process. It's a scientific process uh, made up of progressive steps yeah, from developing the body, developing the energetic side, leading to you know, deep spiritual reala realizations. But of course, I still believe that part of it is providence uh, from the grace of God. Because after the experience, there's a realm you know, beyond. Yeah, something which science might find difficult to prove, but really it exists. Yeah. All right. I will be talking more about that later on. All right. Now, inside the uh, the brain, the central nervous system, are uh, four ventricles. Yeah. Ventricles are compartments or cavities where uh, we produce uh, some rasa, the cerebrospinal fluid. I'm not an expert of the brain anatomy, but I will be giving you. Yeah, an overview of the process and this is good already in understanding it in a general sense. If you want to appreciate the details of this, I suggest that you watch the tutorials of the experts of the brain. All right, so the now first two ventricles, the lateral ventricles of the brain, this is where we produce the largest amount of the somarasa, the cerebrospinal fluid. And um, attached to the holes of the ventricles are what we call choroid plexus. And these are like the collection of blood vessels and cells, particularly the uh, ependymal cells and the uh, various chemical processes happening inside uh, should lead to the production of the cerebrospinal fluid. So in here, yeah, is the first two ventricles. We have two, yeah, right and left hemispheres. And um, attached to walls yeah, of the ventricles are the choroid plexus. That's where the uh, somarasa, uh, CSF, is produced. And then from there, once this ventricle gets filled with the CSF, yeah. Um, a hole or a tube you know, located uh, around the bottom part in the stem of it is called the foramen of Monroe. It's a tube, it's a hole. It opens up and the cerebrospinal fluid shall drain down to the third ventricle. The third ventricle is made up of the following major parts. You have the pineal gland at the back, the thalamus in the middle, 
and the pituitary gland, the front. And this is the seat of meditation. This is important and because later on I will be giving you some information on how the inner brain gets stimulated once the cerebrospinal fluid becomes electrically charged. And from the third ventricle, it passes through this small uh, thin line there. It's called the cerebral aqueduct, this one. Yeah, there's an opening as well there. Once the third ventricle gets filled, the cerebral aqueduct opens up and the cerebrospinal fluid goes down to the fourth ventricle. And the fourth ventricle is around this spot, yeah, close to cere the cerebellum. It's actually small and we also produce cerebrospinal fluid there. There are choroid plexus in, on the fourth ventricle as well. The fourth ventricle is made up of the stem of the brain, which is the pons and the highest or the, the upper part of the medulla oblongata. So those uh, two major parts comprise the fourth ventricle of the brain. So this is the you know, fourth ventricle. And inside the fourth ventricle is um, a pair of lateral uh, foramens, yeah, opening tubes. We call them the uh, foramen of uh, Lushka. And at the base, you have the foramen of Magenti. And these are the exit points of the somarasa, the cerebrospinal fluid, out of the central nervous system. All right. So in a nutshell, that's how we produce the uh, uh, cerebrospinal fluid and how yeah, it descends from the lateral ventricles down to the fourth ventricle. And from the fourth ventricle, the soma rasa, the cerebrospinal fluid, exits the central nervous system. All right. It will exit in two directions. The first direction is around the you know, spaces surrounding the brain. We call that the subarachnoid space. So from the uh, foramen of Lushka and the foramen of Mechendi. So the sub, uh, the CSF, the you know, Samarasa, shall flow through this, 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 this space, like here, and then some will go up, you know, back inside the brain, the behind the occipital lobe, and it will go close to the pineal body at the back. This is important later on because this, yeah, yeah action of this pattern, uh, the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid, once it's electrically charged, will pave way for the stimulation of the pineal gland. And then from there, it will continue to yeah, uh, flow through the gaps, yeah, really right here. This is important as well because at the top, yeah, the surface, the superior sagittal sinus, there are like protrusions there, like uh, granules where the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, the electrically charged cerebrospinal fluid, shall try to exit. Yeah, so in the samadhi, you will be feeling that. And uh, some of it goes down yeah, to the frontal part inside the brain close to the pituitary body. And from this point, a little amount of the cerebrospinal fluid shall flow down the sinuses behind the nasal cavity, you know, right here behind this, you know, inside. There is a reason why in the practice of the Kachari Mudra, this one, where we slide the, the tongue to enter the box of the uvula, behind the bony part of the nasal cavity, close to the brain, we could taste it. And the taste is pretty straightforward, as described in the books. It's slightly salty, sweet, like honey. And it's also referred to as the nectar of immortality. Because the prana itself, which is contained in the cerebrospinal fluid, is eternal. It's forever. It's universal. It's uh, ever-present. And this is the meaning of it. It's not the physical immortality, but you know, we're able to experience the you know, substance which contains this eternal spiritual energy. So at the base, yeah, the stem of the uh, fourth ventricle is another hole, you know, the foramen of Majendi, and this is where it drains out, leading to you know, the spinal cord surrounds the spine, the central canal, yeah, all the way down to the lumbar region, the low back. All right. Now, what is the relation of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid with the techniques we practice in yoga, energy channeling? All right. So I've given many tutorials about the, the significance, the energetic significance of the kriyas, kumbhakas, the mudras, as well as the meditation. All right. So when we practice these methods, which involve the body in controlling the breath, we produce more agni of fire. All right. But of course, we need to open the body. We need to release the blockages. And that's one of the functions of uh, the kriyas or cleansing practices. Now, when we 
control the function of the breath, the, the flow of the breath through pranayama, especially those which we practice kumbhaka as a retention, especially the pura kumbhaka, you know, inhale retention. So we seal more energy, you know, uh, we absorb more energy from this gaseous air that we inspire, and this will lead to the production of what? Agni or the fire. So we build the uh, uh, own energy, we produce our own internal energy, and this energy predominantly comes from the earth element, the heps, which is connected to the element of earth, water, and fire. And this shall now yeah, pave way for the production of electricity. All right, And this electrical uh, element shall blend all right, with the cerebrospinal fluid descending down the spine. And at the bottom of the spine, yeah, around the hips, they blend. So the cerebrospinal fluid, which at first is passive, yeah, it doesn't have any character, it's passive. We, we're not able to feel it in a normal circumstance. It just happens like a part of our autonomic functions. But once yeah, our own fire, the fire of the Agni, blends with the cerebrospinal fluid, which contains the prana, the life force, the presence of God. God descends so from the head. It descends to meet the body energy. And this blending, the mystical union, the blending of these two forces shall lead to the ionization, the electrification of the cerebrospinal fluid. Thus, it becomes an energetic sensation. So it assumes a character from something which is passive and unreacting once our own fire blends with the universal life force, the prana, so it becomes a sensation. All right. And this fire, yeah, shall blend with the cerebrospinal fluid, thus this substance becomes magnetized. And this energy, this fluid, shall rise. Our own energy rises. All right. And this is also the pattern of the cerebrospinal fluid. So from yeah, the top, it goes down and it rises up, yes, flowing through the same central canal. But the energy rising up now is not passive anymore. It's already alive. It's awake. And this is what we call the Kundalini energy. So the Kundalini energy is actually yeah, two yeah, forces blending in one. All right. So I've talked about how the bandhas does that, right? So the bandhas, especially the mula bandha, yeah, they collect and harness the force. They unify the forces. They unify the forces inside. So it can enter the central canal, the Shashumna, and this is the Kundalini rising. All right, so the uh, electrically charged, magnetized, ionized CSF yeah, contains now the fire of the Kundalini, goes up again to the spine, piercing through the astral system, the chakras of the spine, um, resulting in many um, astral phenomena or experiences, yeah, and of course, yeah, this one eventually goes back inside the brain. And then from there, it goes up yeah, and flows through the subarachnoid space, all right? And a part of it goes inside, yeah, behind the occipital lobe, and it will go close to the pineal gland. And this yeah, fluid that goes up there from the base of the spine is electrically charged already. Yeah, it is, uh, I would say, stimulated already with electricity. It contains the electrical force and it will stimulate the pineal gland. All right, now the rest continue. It's a send up right here. And there are like yeah, granulations there, like protrusions, like small gaps, because our brain, uh, it's divided into like uh, four segments, yeah? Um, 
is divided the middle, right and left channels, and divided across as well. All right, and right here, all right, in here, yeah, a few inches above the forehead, not really at the crown, we have the largest of the um, granulations or protrusions. We call them the um, uh, subarachnoid granulations or protrusions. Those are like um, gaps, small gaps, um, veins, yeah, where the cerebrospinal fluid uh, leaks out of the venous system. It goes, um, get, gets absorbed by the veins and it flows through the blood, yeah, giving um, nutrients to our circulate, circulatory system as well. So that is the reason why during Samadhi, this part of our head, yeah, around this spot, becomes sensitive as well. Like something is drilling a hole there, like something is tickling, and you will feel this part of you uh, gets magnetized, like the hair you know, you know, rise up here. Yeah, you will feel it, like something is trying to exit from this point. This is the Sahasrara Chakra. All right, that's the reason why during Samadhi, you will feel this really sensitive. All right, and yeah, it will continue its yeah, flow down to the middle, yeah, between the eyebrows, towards the inside, close to the pituitary gland. That's the Ashen Chakra. That is also the reason why during Samadhi, this becomes like something is tickling here too. Like something is accumulating here, trying to exit this part. Because this is where the uh, cerebrospinal fluid descends going back inside the brain. And you will feel this part of you become sensitive. Inside is the Ajna Chakra and the middle brain. Alright, so what happens now, once this yeah, yeah, inner brain becomes stimulated, the pituitary and especially this one, the pineal gland, this will uh, result in an electrical reaction, chemical reaction. All right. And this is what we call samadhi, All right. so the high energy absorption, samadhi. All right. So once yeah, the pineal gland and the third ventricle becomes stimulated with the magnetized yeah, or electrically charged cerebrospinal fluid, this will lead to samadhi, high absorption. Right, so this is a process, yeah. And how the techniques we do in yoga, yeah, gives or give character, yeah, and power awakens the dormant power of the universal life force, the prana, yeah, which is present around us, in and around us. Although, yeah, without the kundalini, yeah, this energy is passive. It's not reacting. Yeah, it's just sitting there floating and without us feeling it. But once our own fire blends with the prana, we feel its present in our bodies. Yeah. When we meditate or when we practice those energy channeling methods. Alright. And um what makes this happen? Alright, really. Yeah. Is it the guarantee that when we practice the Kriyas, if we practice the Kumbhakas, um, is it the guarantee that we will be able to attain Samadhi? No. Because we need to regulate the levels of electricity we allow to blend with the prana, with the prana contained in, uh, within the cerebrospinal fluid. If we produce too much fire, we will burn yeah, the soma. We will burn the, the essence of the prana. This prana is so delicate. Too much will render our meditation useless because the nervous system, if we send too much electricity there, we overload the nervous system, we overstimulate the nervous system, and it will not happen. All right. And the danger is we might end up hurting the brain, damaging the brain, the neurons there. All right. So uh, the bandhas, uh, would have to be developers. Yeah, so the bandhas regulate the levels of electricity, the forces we allow to blend and flow through our inner bodies. So we only achieve that subtle electrical stimulation yeah, uh, good enough yeah, to cause absorption, to lightly stimulate the inner brain. 
too little, it will not happen to. So meditation is like your alchemist, blending forces inside. And this is the beauty of that because really this is scientific. And the lessons of the teacher uh, is so vital because you know, through that you will be given a specific program. All right. Um, we can't be doing too many elements, uh, unrelated elements, uncohesive elements in our practice. So we need to really plan. And for example, the time. Uh, how long should we do a certain technique because we can't be holding our breath we can't be practicing pranayama for many hours because it will produce too much fire uh, we can't be combining asana then right after asana you do your meditation because when you do your asana your body is electrically charged you're too much energized so you need to balance yeah and the teacher has been through the process and out of it will be able to give you the specific program you know, based on your nature, based on your time, based on your uh, circumstance. Right? But it's possible. It's possible to happen. Yeah? If you do the lessons um, religiously. And the steps to yoga will be able to help you attain that. Alright. That is also the reason why meditation should be approached with care. Especially those techniques which we regulate the natural pattern of the breath. And those simple ones, for example, listening to sounds or when we vigorously shake the bodies, they need to be approached with utmost care. All right. A beginner in the practice should not, should avoid you know, practicing energy channeling methods, meditation. Just relax the body and that's enough. All right. Because you don't want to be, for example, you're a beginner, you don't want to be um, awakening yeah, your subconscious mind before it's time. And because some people are energetically sensitive and here we are doing the process because everyone is doing it and we end up hurting ourselves and children to kids should be spared from meditation actually children you know, should not practice yoga until they're like uh, reach the age of 13 or 15 because children are energetic energetically sensitive to begin with they're open they're so close to being pure and let them enjoy their innocence let them enjoy their youth because once their uh, subconscious mind opens up this holds our karmas and children might not be ready to face that yeah, spiritual uh, challenges it's not all beautiful you know, there are ugly sides to it as well let them enjoy and then yoga is just there when they are ready to tackle it when they're yeah, at uh, like um, mature enough you know, to understand uh, both the physicality the spirituality of the practice oh yes yeah so hopefully this one uh, helps you understand yeah and connect yeah, the science of behind meditation and what happens during meditation inside the body the substances we produce inside the body now before I forget right, there is a dimension after this euphoric experience this energy that flows to our body yeah, shall leave our physical entity literally it will exit the body and there are several exit points the crown of the head as i mentioned right here the forehead it could exit from the chest the heart it could exit from the backs of the body, the backs of the lungs. It could exit from the hips. Those are the exit points of the energy. And while it's traveling around, you witness this phenomenon. And your vital functions intermittently stops. It's like dying in the conscious state. Your heart you know, will stop intermittently. Your breath will stop but you're breathing inside through the bandhas. You know, we call that Kevala Kumbhaka. So the bandhas here are your energetic support you know, to bring you back you know, if the pressure gets heavy. And without the bandhas, this could be dangerous. This could lead to collapse of the vital systems. Yes, and this dimension is something which science might find difficult to prove. 
but really is excess. Yeah. And from that experience, we will realize uh, our true spiritual nature. We all come from this pure, unaltered form of energy, consciousness. And it's fleeting around, it's floating around, and it's ever-present. So this is the eternity of the Soma. It's not physical immortality, yeah, but it's the eternity of our spirits. I'll see you in the next lesson. Have a meaningful meditation. Namaste.